Hello and welcome to the new series that I'm calling Mod 101. And the reason I'm calling it that is because I want to do a sort of detailed modification of very specific engines and do all the legwork to finding the parts. That way you don't have to do any of the guesswork that I had to do. And I really wish that this would have existed when I was learning how to do this kind of stuff because it would have saved so much more time and money. But again, I'm able to do that now so I might as well make the series for said things. So we're going to start with this Tecumseh, which I had one of these before, I sold it, and I figured since these are fairly common, I would get another one, and this is gonna be the test bed to see if this series actually works. I'm gonna to try to focus this on engines you find pretty regularly available, like ones on pressure washers, snow blowers, lawn mowers, all that sort of stuff. I'm gonna probably avoid vertical shaft stuff because that is a whole nother can of worms as far as making it work for a power sport application. So we're gonna stick with that, that's the only minimum criteria. Other than that though, it's gonna be stuff you find you know, yard sales or just may already have. So all the links or information is going to be in the description or throughout the video depending on when I find stuff and or if I remember where I got it from. Feel free to chime in below if you have any ideas or improvements that we can make because again this is the test bed episode. I have no idea how long this is going to take or how it's going to work out. So input's always appreciated. So the engine we're going to start with for this inaugural episode is the five and a half horse overhead valve Tecumseh. These did come in a wide variety. There's snow blowers, there's wood chippers, there's pressure washers, I think. They even came on go-karts originally. I don't know which models, but there are power sports versions of these as well. So they're very readily available and fairly common to just come across. So being that this engine's a little weird and a little hard to work with, I'm gonna just do the legwork and find you all the part numbers and locations for where to find the parts and also just what to look for for modifying them. Because again, they're very common, but they don't easily work for power sport applications unless you're willing to do modifications. And with this, we're gonna to try to keep it budget wise. So I'm thinking uh, somewhere between $1,500, excluding the purchase of the engine because that would literally blow the budget. This one specifically is model OHSK55. There's a bunch of different other ones, but they're all basically the same, just different cranks. The information will apply to probably a dozen different models of these. So again, if it's a five, five and a half, or six horse, and as long as it's like this setup where the, you know, the Valkyrie's right here and all that, a majority of the information is the same. Obviously this one's a Snow Kings or Snowblower version. The other summer versions have a plastic air box that sits here and has a little flat panel air filter in it. Snowblowers don't even run air filters, so this is just a protective cover for the carb and there's no air filter behind it. That's just a unique thing, but again, we're deleting all that anyway, so it doesn't particularly matter. The only difference really that matters, it doesn't matter in my specific instance, but if you do have one of these Snow King engines, this is probably how it's set up where it has a cam driven pulley and also a crank driven pulley. The cam driven pulley powers the wheels and the crank driven pulley powers the auger. It's really strange. I think the budget way to make this work would be to just cut this shaft off, leaving a portion of it in the case so it doesn't leak oil, and then just try to find a one inch diameter sprocket or CVT. But also the point of this video is not to show you how to mount this to a mini bike and adapt it or whatever. It's just showing you how to modify it to get the most out of it. So again, if I were to tackle this, I'd have to buy a crankshaft from like an OHH60, like a standard power sport version of this, a case cover for that same engine, and also a cam for that engine. All of which I forget how much I totaled it up at. It's like $350, which I can find much better engines for $350. So that's not financially reasonable. I just didn't realize it had this when I bought the snowblower. We're just gonna ignore that. Also, we can just ignore the rest of the snowblower because I'm just using it as an engine mount at this point. So before I get stripping it down real quick, I'll go through the basic maintenance things. When I got this, the oil was tar black. You could not see through it. So I just put some Marvel in it, let it run. I also had to drop the fuel ball and just do a really quickie carb clean because it wouldn't run. It does now. I let it run for probably five or 10 minutes just to get warm enough and mix up the oil, change that out, put fresh oil in with an additive, which in this case I use, I tend to use this stuff for additives. Most of the small engines are flat tap it, if I remember correctly. Being such, they usually like to have a little extra additives as far as like zinc goes. And so I, I get about five or six small engines out of each container, so it's worthwhile to me. You don't really have to. It's just an extra precaution that cantaloupes don't destroy themselves. Just follow whatever the engine says. Usually it's on the oil cap itself. Since this is meant for cold weather, I would assume it's by 030 or straight 30. These small engines are very loose tolerant, so it's not like you're gonna hurt it. Um, but again, I do prefer doing a, some sort of friction modifier or zinc additive just to help protect it. As far as the plug goes, I already put it in. 
um, but I go with NGK BPR 6ES. They're super common. I think the actual part number for you to like an auto part store is 7131. I think it had some champion in it originally and it was hands down original because this engine, if I remember right, is a 96. Being that the oil looked like trash and the plug was also trash, I'm guessing this thing probably only had a handful of services done to it over its lifetime, which it's still running. So I guess it doesn't matter all that much. This one uses a key for as a kill switch, so that when the key's in, it breaks the circuit and doesn't ground. When you remove the key, it grounds and shuts the engine off. Uh, we're not gonna use that. We're gonna wire it for a kill switch like a mini bike would have. Not a big deal there. This engine also has a charging system and also an electric starter, both of which we're not gonna use. With these lawnmower carbs, you can make them work. The only real issue is they don't take kindly to inclines, bumps, abuse of that nature. And also when you hook a throttle cable to it, like a regular twist throttle or whatever, there's so little throw in this butterfly valve that it, it ends up being basically on off. There's no real throttle modulation available. The way to make that work is basically put an arm on here. That way it increases the leverage and also the throw. We're gonna remove it. I don't like using them. They're just not really worthwhile in my opinion. So we have some really sketchily wired together stuff. It looks like the kill switch broke at one point. It has two kill switches actually. It has the key and also the throttle it has a kill switch on it as well. That's the breather on the valve cover. This is, oh, this is the primer. That's what that is. Uh, we can also delete that too, because we're not gonna use it. This governor linkage can go away. Oh, all I did was bent it. Okay, great. So the carb we're gonna use is gonna have a standard throttle cable and a twist grip throttle. So we don't need any of this stuff. Governor, unfortunately, will get bypassed. There's no way around it to work with the carb that I currently have. If you're gonna do this, just be mindful to not over rev it. Vent, and get out of here. I'm just gonna leave it attached because we still want it to vent. I wouldn't just leave this vent for the crankcase exposed. I would run it to a catch can or put a little filter on it or something because you know mud daubers can get in there and build nests and block it up and then the engine doesn't run well because it's not venting. Like this shouldn't be blocked entirely and also shouldn't be left open. So you gotta find some sort of solution there. Well, luckily this fuel line's already been modified, which made it easy to remove, but it, normally it runs behind the flywheel, which most of the time you have to remove the flywheel to get access to it. But it looks like since they replaced this, maybe it's a little smaller diameter or what, I have no idea, but it, it was easy to pull out, which is great. So dipstick's off, it's threaded in. It's just a standard thread for like fill ports that are normally like right here. I'm just gonna throw a plug in here for now because the dipstick needs to stay out in order to have access to other stuff, but I don't want dirt getting in there. Yes, just standard like Briggs or whatever thread. Okay, and gas tank just slides away. And then two, three eighths on the bottom. Okay, and this should be everything. Yes, easy enough. The other thing we're gonna do while we're in here is make sure the gap is good for the coil. This is something I heard get debated whether or not it actually works, but it's cleaning the contact points on the coil and the magnet. I think it does, some people say it doesn't, and even if I'm wrong, it doesn't hurt to do it anyway. So I already cleaned up the magnet one a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the coil off and clean that up. Just get all the surface rust off and get them cleaned up. Then we'll regap the coil when it comes time to put it back on. The rule of thumb is just use a business card which is 0 0.015, I believe. The metal's starting to separate from rust, at least on the center igniter and this one side. This coil's probably not long for this world, but we'll just clean it up anyway. Same with the magnet and then put it back together. Turns out there were mice living in the shroud because they chewed up the coil. I mean, I already found remnants of them, but that is just, I mean, it doesn't really do anything. It's just kind of funny that they thought that was good nest building material. So I just need to run a wire to the back of the coil for the kill switch. So just one wire is all that's needed to kill the ignition on this engine, AKA run a kill switch. So you just get a regular spade connector, plug it into the back of the coil, and then run this, the wire to a switch. And then from the switch, you're gonna run to a ground, it's just the chassis or whatever, or back to the engine. I've got a bunch of parts in, and I think at this point I do have enough to make something work. The issue I had was the intake manifold itself. 
The exhaust, I did actually happen to find a company that makes exhaust headers. The company makes this style header, which is just a generic one. Then they also have this style, which has a threaded fitting at the end to accept a three quarter inch muffler. Being that I know what frame this is gonna go on, I think it should be quieter. So chances are we're gonna use this one. Also the fact that if I were to use a generic performancey style muffler, I'd have to weld it on here. And I think that kind of defeats the purpose of the episode. We're trying to stay under a certain budget and also under a certain skill level and resource level. I bought this one thinking it would be the same size as this fitting, but it's not. This is half inch and this is three quarter. On top of that, this muffler is the cheaper version when you get the threaded fitting with it. I think it's like $6 less than the slip-on style. The slip-on one would work on here, but it also would put us over budget. As far as the intake goes, that's probably the hardest thing that I had to source. I bought probably a dozen different random Tecumseh intake manifolds, hoping to find one that would have the right orientation of flanges. So that way, if I had my bolt-on flange carb, it would sit right. But it's impossible as far as I can tell. I've literally spent $150 in intakes just to find one that would work. And turns out I didn't have to do any of that because this intake came in a kit with a really junky Makuni clone carb that mounts the flange and also a really junky filter. I haven't been able to find this as an individual component yet. I will link it below once I do find it, but this is what's gonna work. What we're gonna have to do is just cut this flange off and then use a section of rubber hose to connect this to the carb. Speaking of the carb, Finding a spigot mount carb in a Makuni clone is really hard to find. I can buy this from Makuni and I think it's like $180 or something like that. This is a 24 millimeter round slide. I think these came on like TTR 125s and a couple other things. I could have just bought the name brand one and blown the budget entirely, but it took me forever to find a Chinese clone spigot mount. And what made it really difficult is that none of the Chinese listings use the word spigot. Did actually find it eventually, which is great. It has an actual pull choke, which was also an issue because a lot of them that I found used a cable choke. So like I said, I'm gonna to to cut off this flange here and then mount this. And the way to mount it is I went and bought a generic radiator hose, which matches the 34 millimeter inlet that this carb is, or rather outlet. And we're just gonna cut probably like a one inch section off of here and then just clamp these two together. Also in the same kit that included this intake was a uni style filter. It was a clone one, like we have a real one here but this is off an older project that I ended up selling. So in my mind, this is free because I already had it. In all actuality, it was probably about 30 bucks. The base of the cheap filter had literally ripped free of the filter material, like almost immediately. I applied a little bit of pressure to it and it just fell right off. So I'm happy we didn't use that junk one that came in this kit because chances are it would have fallen off while riding, wouldn't have noticed, and then it would have sucked up dirt into the engine. To buy this kit for $22 just for this intake doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So I'll try to source where this came from and just find the individual listing. The only issue with this intake is the holes don't line up exactly right. Thankfully, the spacing of the holes currently are further out on the flanges, so there is space to narrow it, which is what we need to do. The only thing I don't like about the setup is the carb's gonna kind of sit out a little far. If you think of it as a mini bike frame, literally the carb's gonna stick out a good four inches out the side of the frame. So not ideal, but anyways, I think it'll work. Right there's the end of the crankshaft. And there's another like four inches of filter. Not the most protected method, but it'll work. So that is all we need. wasn't supposed to do that. We had to make a revision to the intake manifold. I tried to use that 90 degree aluminum one. Everything bolted up, but when it came to actually installing it on the head, once I got the bolt holes opened up enough that they would actually bolt on, there was a like, gap on the back here where it would just be a constant vacuum leak. And the only way to make that work would then be to make like a little spacer plate. I remembered I had one of these standard Honda clone intakes and it happened to be a direct bolt in. The only real customization required is I have to trim it shorter so that way it pulls all this closer to the head. And also I had to open up the holes from six millimeter to quarter inch, which, which I think is six and a half millimeter. Other than that, it bolts right in. Also I had to make my own gaskets. So this one here is the original intake gasket it came with. And when I install it on the head, 
there's a gap on the side here where there's just no gasket material, so it would just leak. So I had to make a little bit larger one just to take up that difference. But I think I need to make it just a tad bit larger just to take up the last of the gap that is in the head currently. Because again, it's not running right, and I think it's doing so because it's getting air that is behind the carb. So, pretty straightforward. This is just standard gas material. You can just buy this at like any hardware store pretty much. And I just trace that intake manifold and then cut it out. That's the part number for the intake manifold. So yeah, if you just look up Honda Clone intake, you'll find this one. There's a couple different sizes and styles of these intakes you can get. Most of them have flanges on both ends. This one's just a tube so you can just clamp a hose onto it just like we have currently. I'm actually kind of surprised by how loud this exhaust was since I was just thinking this was going to be quieter than the standard performance muffler, which I think it would be, but this still peaked at like 109 decibels. That's borderline too loud. Again, I'm pretty surprised by how this muffler sounded, especially since it was only like $7 versus like the $25 performance muffler. So yeah, pretty happy with that actually. The chrome on it has peeled off like immediately. So what I'll probably end up doing is just get it through another couple heat cycles, let the rest of it burn off, and I'll probably just put a coat of paint on it. So I think this is a pretty good place to stop. There's not a whole lot else to do aside from tuning the carb, but that's not really important because the whole premise of this episode was to show you where to find parts and how to modify certain engines. I have decided on a budget for these episodes, which is gonna be about $100. I didn't wanna set a number in the beginning because I didn't know how much it was gonna to cost to actually build the thing. Now that I've built one, I can kind of narrow down a budget. So we're gonna to aim to be at around $100, and that's not including the engine purchase. We're gonna assume with all these episodes that you already have an engine. In this case, I paid $40 for the snowblower, so whatever, $140 to do all this. And I'm also trying to avoid making bespoke things and trying to buy off the shelf items and just show you how to make it and just show you how to install it and make it work. I think that's the easiest way to make a recreatable outcome. With this, the total budget was $105.80. The exhaust was the most expensive bit and that's, I mean, it is a nice piece, but that really kind of threw me for a curveball. I wasn't expecting the exhaust to cost that much. If I had just made it from scratch, it would have cost me only a couple dollars, but again, that requires experience, tools, and whatnot, so that's kind of out. It kind of defeats the purpose of the episode. All the links for the stuff, or at least the information for the stuff, will be below. So yeah, again, feel free to, to chime in if you have any input on how we can make this a little bit better, or narrow down the focus a little bit more. I'm gonna stick with engines that you can find readily available on Marketplace or Craigslist or whatever, because there's hundreds of videos out there already for Predators and Animals, Honda, GX, 190s, you know, the really common ones you can just go straight buy. We're gonna aim to stick for ones that you buy used somewhere, like a yard sale or whatever, or a state sale. Or you may even just have. That's the only real limiting criteria here is we're not gonna go just go buy brand new engines and modify them, because there's already enough content on that. But yeah, with all that being said, thanks for watching and stay tuned. Asshole. You know what? I might be stupid.